DNA. It holds the blueprint for exactly what jokes I can get away with. But you know, if you're 0 .0 something percent African still, just don't. Don't say it, don't say that word. But researchers are looking at better uses for DNA than just being the joke police or creating traffic jams, specifically as a structural element for nanobots and molecular machines that could one day cure aging, let us breathe on Mars, or turn sewage into ribeye steaks. One of the leaders in this space is professor of biophysics Hendrik Dietz. He recently gave a TED talk about the incredibly exciting progress happening in the field. So first, you should know that state-of-the-art bio-nanotechnology isn't really that exciting. It's actually kind of rather boring. Oh, okay, not the best nanotech salesman. Wait, no, I get it. This is the famous German sense of humor. Classic dry German setup. This is gonna be good. It's like working with stone tools, but on the nanometer scale. It's like people go out into nature, they pick something up that's lying around, they take it and whack it against something else. There you have your tool. So this is of course a little bit exaggerated, but there's some truth to it. Okay, technically that was a joke. Well done, Heinrich. Now that the ice is sufficiently broken, please commence the scientific flabbergasting. I want to show you a, a modern um, marker structure that has been self-assembled from design DNA sequences. So you can see here um, four different types of shells that we have built. Tiny blue balls that could one day travel inside your tiny blue balls to start or stop the production of sperm, controlled via smartphone. I mean, yeah. I just made that up, but that's exactly the kind of thing you'll be able to do after this field hits the knee of the curve. Welcome to Knee of the Curve, using futurism as an excuse to make dick jokes since 2019. Don't get left in the past, hit subscribe to stay up to date on blood cell sized Alexis. I'm a comedian, filmmaker, and futurist with just enough charm to convince my girlfriend to let me do this to our bedroom. And while I'm super happy with this setup, she did ask me to invite you to join Patreon or become a YouTube member so I can eventually afford to have a real studio and give her back the room. Also, if you're at all entertained by this, please have a go at that like button and consider subscribing to the channel or buying some merch or donating on PayPal or Bitcoin or just sharing this with a fellow nerd. That'd be huge. By the way, this is a collaboration episode with a full on YouTube celebrity, Joe Scott. So stick around to the end to see Joe's cameo. Okay. Most people think of nanotech the way it's depicted in the movies. The type of tech that can build larger structures from the atomic level up. Where'd that come from? It's nanotech, you like it? Yes, we do. And the progress toward achieving it is well underway. In fact, if progress continues to grow exponentially, we could see something like this in our lifetimes. There are two methods being developed simultaneously that could one day meet in the middle to achieve this. Top, down, bottom up. That's the way we like to Nanotech has been used for decades. It uses large machines to create small machines, like using lasers and plasmas to etch transistors in silicone. This process has led to the exponential shrinkage of chips that simultaneously get faster while using less power, prompting Ray Kurzweil to predict this. Technology is getting smaller and smaller at an exponential rate. 25 years from now, computers will be a billion times more powerful per dollar. They'll be 100,000 times smaller. They'll be the size of blood cells. They can go inside the brain and connect the neocortex to the cloud wirelessly. To which Elon Musk, of course, said, 25 years? Hold my beer. Elon Musk's Neuralink is creating nanofibers small enough to interact with neurons right now. The top-down method ultimately aims to create little metal machines with microchips that self-replicate and swim around your bloodstream fixing things. But this approach could prove to have its problems. For one, the body contains salty, corrosive materials that could cause these machines to break down. Because you want these electrodes to last for many decades uh, in, in the brain, but the, this is quite a difficult environment. Um, it really wants to corrode. Uh, so getting the right, the right uh, coatings is incredibly difficult. It's 
tough material science problem. Second, the material used in current technology may cause harmful effects in the body or get rejected by the immune system. Third, sculpting tiny machines out of larger materials might be too costly to produce at an industrial scale. So a bottom-up approach, coaxing atoms and molecules to self-assemble into larger structures may be the key to true nanomachines. DNA is the obvious choice for a building block. It's already been doing the job for millions of years. So like any great artist, we're gonna steal. In fact, soon I'm gonna steal a joke from the Lonely Island. And if you catch it, call it out in the comments. Whoever's first gets a free knee the curve mug. Here's a hint, it's not the video clip. All right, leading the charge to infringe on nature's copyright is Caltech research professor Paul Rothamund. So what kind of things are we interested in building? So here's a catalog of molecular parts, the molecular machines that make up your cells and make your entire body work. Uh, there's a virus here to scale, just to show you what a cold virus is, but you can see the girders that give cells their form. You can see the motors that allow your muscles to move. If we zoom in, you can see the camera that makes your eye work. You can see the solar cells that harvest the energy for the biosphere. And you can see the switches that orchestrate the whole thing and, and govern biological development. Now, DNA nanotechnologists around the world are working to create all of these things out of DNA. Every cell in our body contains DNA. And plastic now, apparently. So cool. We're trash cyborgs. I was hoping for something more badass like Kevlar skin, but okay, that's a start. DNA has a twisted double helix structure made up of two strands zippered up together by four molecules called nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which we will just call A, T, G, and C. Because time is precious. Maybe once we have nanobots that can cure aging, we can indulge ourselves by taking the time to fully pronounce the entire words. But for now, so we don't get old, it's A, T, G, and C. All of these molecular machines, including DNA, are formed and carry out their functions because of basic physics. So the key to creating machines at this scale is a first principles understanding of how the molecules function. Once we can manipulate that, it'll be a little like magic. There's an ancient and universal concept that words have power, that spells exist. In fact, what you can do at the molecular level is that if you encode information, you encode a spell or program as molecules, then physics can actually, actually directly interpret that information and run a program. That's what happens in proteins. When this amino acid sequence gets pronounced as atoms, these little letters are sticky for each other. It collapses into a three-dimensional shape that turns it into a nanomachine that actually cuts DNA. There are many ways of casting molecular spells uh, using DNA. What we really want to do in the end is learn how to program self-assembly so that we can build anything. That's exactly how I thought my Instant Pot would be, but so far I've only been able to make chili from a can. The DNA zipper only zips because of the molecular bonds of the A, T, G, and C molecules. A's on one strand always pair with T's on the other strand. G's always pair with C's. It's a chemical thing, just like how cheerleaders always pair with jocks and goths always pair with other goths. Bad example. But every 13-year-old knows T and A go together, and then the other two go with each other. It's process of elimination. Anyway, these bonds dictate exactly how the DNA folds up. This DNA origami is called DNA origami. And what we're going to do is we're going to add short strands, which we call staples. And each one of the staples has a following form. It has a left half and it has a right half. And the left half binds in, in an A, T, C, G pairwise way, the Watson, famous Watson-Crick binding, it binds one position on this long strand. And in the same Watson-Crick pairwise way, A pairing to T, C pairing to G, it binds a distant, lo distant location. And it brings those two distant locations together. It enforces a constraint, and that's our crease. And the net action of 200 of these things, making all kinds of creases, fold this long strand into some shape, for example, a rectangle. Besides DNA origami, the big brains over at Harvard have turned them into Legos. The pin of one brick is able to plug into the hole of another brick. 
but only if the DNA sequences of the two strands that make up the pin and the hole are complementary. The blocks self-assemble, connecting only in areas where the DNA sequences complement each other. So, what have the best and brightest scientific minds decided to make with this biological wizardry? I designed this fold, we designed them in a computer program, it spits out a list. We send the email to a company in Iowa, they have a robotic chemist called a DNA synthesizer, it builds up these 200 strands, A, C, G, T, and they send back in FedEx 200 strands. You get 50 million DNA origami in a single tube. Cool, smiley face cancer. Really dropped the ball not making those Pac-Men and ghosts. But this was just 2016 proof of concept stuff. Remember, this is how small nature's machinery is, but this is how big those smiley faces were. More recently, we've been able to make boxes for when a gift needs given. See, I'm wise enough to know when a gift needs given. And I got just the one. But instead of delivering unsolicited penasia, it's a plural for penis that I invented today. Instead of that, these containers are targeted for use as part of a drug delivery nanobot. It encapsulates the drug of interest, and the idea is it's supposed to open if and only if it touches a cell that's the one that you want to deliver the drug to. And indeed, it really looks like this. You put a drug in the box, and the only thing that can open it is the cancer it's sent to cure. Hyper-targeted drug delivery would cut down on side effects, like how chemotherapy wreaks havoc on healthy cells, which everyone knows Sucks a bag of dicks. Is it like a paper bag and they're sticking out like baguettes, kind of like you went shopping? Easy, Louie. And this is not just a theory. In 2018, scientists from China's National Center for Nanoscience and Technology and Arizona State University verified this by injecting mice with a DNA nanobox and they were able to successfully shrink tumors. Some very near-term goals for this tech are nanobots to maintain cells in the body and even adding functionality like repairing DNA, removing blockages in arteries, and providing blood clot capabilities. But our boy Hendrik has a special dream. So my dream is one day to build a rotary motor and on a nanoscale, we don't have that yet, but maybe things will you know, improve a lot once we have those. The motor we're all familiar with is the sperm cells flagellum, but our bodies contain tons of really strange motors. Some of them include motors for synthesizing ATP, the energy molecules of our cells. There are also transporter molecules called motor proteins that carry stuff around within the cell by walking across filaments that are like your cells rigging. There's little dudes walking around your DNA. That is so much more impressive than just a smiley face. In fact, this is what happened when the smiley face saw that. Basically, the way it works is that a chemical reaction occurs at one foot, which causes the back foot to release from the surface, and then the molecule rotates to take a step. These reactions keep occurring in series between the two feet, and it creates a walking motion on the nanoscale fibers in the cells. This is essentially the most elaborate domino chain possible. That's what life is. The only thing crazier is how close we're getting to duplicating this tech. Researchers in Japan have used DNA origami to create motors that stimulate muscle contractions. Researchers from Emory University and Georgia Institute of Tech created the world's fastest nanomotor that goes up to 100 nanometers per minute with a horsepower of 0.000000, you get it. Essentially the same horsepower as a new Geo Metro. But it's not just research. Synthetic biology companies raised over 12 billion in venture capital. Some of the most exciting stocks are companies like Twist Biosciences, whose price is up over 117% since the world decided biotech was something worth caring about. If DNA nanobots are the gold in a new gold rush, Twist business model is selling tiny picks and axes. Meet a streamlined way to order the DNA you want online. If you have a design for a new DNA nanobot, you can order all your component parts from Twist. They're just one company in a fast-growing field of startups trying to do for evolution what Amazon did for retail. Not destroy it, make it easier, more convenient, and accessible. Point-click abs. Point-click blue skin. Point-click genius. Boom, I'm Dr. Manhattan, I live on Mars with my dick out, and we're in the singularity. Took three clicks, everybody. How hard is that? This is what we're looking for. 
For an episode all about the singularity, click right here. But this show is called Near the Curve. It's a show about extreme change. And why does that matter? Well, extreme change can have upsides and downsides. One major concern with using DNA for nanotechnology is it's a very efficient replication machine. If we lose control of our ability to stop it from replicating, it could grow exponentially and consume the entire globe. When it comes to existential threats, a runaway self-replicating nanoswarm is right up there with asteroid impacts and Skynet. It's called the gray goo scenario, which if that's not the name of a porn, someone needs to be fired. By the way, we're not just using biological material to make nanobots, we're using it to make macrobots full-on, human-sized bishop from Aliens androids. Trust me. <laughs> My buddy Joe Scott, who, look, if you know about me and you don't know about him, then I don't understand the YouTube algorithm at all. But Joe and I coordinated our topics this week, and he's just uploaded an entire video on biological macrobots. Right, Joe? What are you doing, man? Come on. Joe. Whoa. Joe. Uh, yeah, so go watch Joe's video. I'm sure he's fine. Joe, you good? Blink twice if you're safe. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine, Emmett. It's cool. Yeah, just uh, go ahead and send your people over. Will do. Also, I have to mention, the skeleton for this episode was constructed by one of my Patreon supporters. I just kind of cyborged it. Brad wrote a perfectly reasonable script, totally good, but my Dr. Frankenstein ego had to go in and cyborg the shit out of it. More dick jokes! So anyway, thank you, Brad. And if you want to take part in helping these scripts, just join me over on Discord where I post all the view links to the scripts and I just talk smack about futurism with all the cool people that have joined over there. And if you're still watching, I assume you enjoyed it. So maybe hit that like button, leave a comment. And if you're not already subscribed, I hope you consider doing that and hitting the bell to get notified. These patrons and YouTube members are the lifeblood of this channel. Thank you for your support. Go check out all the exclusive content and perks I post over on Patreon and consider joining as a YouTube member. Ryan Stout, Jeremy Huntley, Brian Westerfeld helped me punch up jokes for this script. Thanks guys. Find me on Twitter and Instagram or just click one of these videos to stay up to date on how technology is changing everything. Thanks for watching. Peace.